All right. So, good afternoon. All right. Good afternoon, user. Right. I, I would say afternoon, morning, uh, and evening because I think we're being broadcast uh, all across uh, the, the U.S. and, of course, we're in various time zones and, and of course, uh, in some of our U.S. territories. So uh, today, uh, I'm excited, uh, really, to uh, first of all, I think I, what I want to do is introduce uh, me uh, to to Userec. And the second part of this, once I kind of talk a little bit about me, uh, I will turn it over to our Command Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major John Foley, uh, who actually joined uh, this great organization, Userec, at the same time uh, that I actually uh, arrived. So we are the command team. We're the new command team for USAREC, and we're, we're absolutely excited about uh, what we want to do uh, and where USAREC is going and how we can help enable this organization to meet uh, the demands of, of our Army, which are, uh, which are truly uh, the fundamental focus of you know, how we build and how we grow uh, an Army that's uh, got an extremely critical mission for the United States of America. So first, I'm going to start with me. I, uh, I I am an Army brat. For those who may not know it, I was uh, born uh, at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, my father was uh, was a career Army soldier. I also have some uh, brothers who served. Both of my brothers served in the in the Army. They're both uh, since retired. Uh, I've got a son who serves uh, now. Uh, he's at Fort Carson. I've got uh, also a son who's currently in ROTC uh, at my alma mater, Ca Campbell University in North Carolina, who uh, wants to, uh, of course, pursue an Army career in the future once he graduates. So we are we are an Army family. Uh, my uh, wife uh, comes from uh, an Army family as well. Uh, her father served, and uh, we truly are, are committed to this great profession uh, that we have been a part of uh, pretty much at least around it uh, for, for all of our lifetime. I can, I can truly say that. And so um, I am uh, very interested in ensuring that uh, and invested in ensuring that our Army uh, is the Army that I have always been around and the Army that I think uh, should be the Army that takes us into the future because uh, we are relying on uh, the young generation of soldiers to come in and serve in this great profession. And with, with that, we want to make sure that as we eventually depart, uh, that our Army is in good hands. And what, what you all are doing today is really you're growing the future of our Army. The Army that we will see uh, in 2025, 2030, uh, and decades uh, beyond uh, that will wear this uniform and, uh, and will actually serve our country in just uh, tremendous fashion. So your legacy is being created today, believe it or not, and that's the value and the importance, I think, that all of our recruiters uh, and uh, our DA civilians that are helping uh, enable what we do, um, that's the legacy that we will all leave. I, I do want to talk about family. I mentioned my family as well. Uh, I think family is, is absolutely important. It is it is the reason why we can do what we do. And uh, we put a lot of demands on uh, our soldiers, our, our non-commissioned officers, our officers, uh, warrant officers. We put a, a huge amount of demand on, on every single one of you with the expectation that your family um, will, will be the ones that kind of guide uh, our family structure while we're we're doing the things that the Army is asking us to do. And some, in a lot of cases, because we love what we do, we enjoy what we're doing. But, it, but our family, they're definitely a critical to our success. And so uh, I say that because um, for us to be focused on our mission, our, our family has to want, they've got to also be supportive. And we've got to make sure that the family network is, is, um, is solid. Uh, so that uh, we can we can go out and do what we love and we can serve in whatever very varied formations and organizations that we we want to serve in uh, because if uh, if the family is not taken care of then of course um, there's a couple options that that our families can make and uh, and and one is they can vote with their feet 
and uh, and they can go do other things. And so that's why I say family is absolutely critical to what we do uh, as an army. And uh, and so we can never lose the fact and not include them into everything that we do um, because uh, they are helping us in, in, in our ability to be successful. And then the last thing I do want to say before I turn it over to the Sergeant Major uh, to introduce himself, uh, that uh, I am a huge sports fan. Absolutely, absolutely uh, huge. I will talk about any uh, sports uh, that you want to talk about. Now, I may not be an expert at it, uh, but uh, but I definitely will talk about it. Now, I, I have been, you know, I do think that I have uh, some some pretty good skills in certain areas. I, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I think I'm probably one of the best basketball players that ever donned a military uniform. And, and so I will I will tell you that I am. Now, my wife will probably beg to differ. Uh, but, uh, but this is not her show right now. This is mine. And so, um, so I am a pretty good, uh, basketball player. Uh, I'm also a pretty good golfer. And, uh, and so I, I do like sports. Now the two teams that I follow, uh, just so all of my recruiters know that I, I, there's two teams that I really, really, uh, are, and that I'm passionate about. And that's, uh, one, uh, the university of North Carolina Tar Heels. I'm a big Tar Heel fan. Uh, and uh, and I do follow. I guess it's the Washington NFL football team right now. Okay, we don't have a we don't have a uh, a, uh, a name uh, mascot uh, that we're you know we're in the process of trying to figure this whole thing out, but eventually we will. So I do follow the team that uh, that is up in the national capital region uh, that wear, wears burgundy and gold. And so I'll leave it at that. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my battle buddy. Commands our Major John Foley. Sir, thank you very much. And uh, I, I'll start off with, just like you all, I am proud to be an American soldier and serve in our Army. And uh, it's it's been a, it's a truly a privilege and an honor to be part of this command, to be part of your team, um, to be your Sergeant Major um, for this command. I don't take that lightly, and I take it very seriously. And I think this is an important mission for our Army and, um, and this command is about leadership. It really is. And that engagement, that inspirational leadership um, that, uh, you know, we are here to provide you. So I'm here to serve you. So a little bit about me. Uh, I joined the Army at the age of 17. I'm from Panama City, Florida. I'm actually an Air Force brat. And, uh, you know, my dad's retired Air Force, uh, retired 1974 after three tours in Vietnam. And so... Uh, I had two brothers as well that joined the Air Force, and so my entire family has been in the Air Force, and I decided to go in the Army because I wanted to do something uh, bigger and better on my own and to make a difference, and uh, that's one of the primary reasons. The other reason is that's what we do in our in our family is we join uh, the service, and we think serving our country is very, very important, and then a lot, like a lot of you, I joined for the Army College Fund, and um, uh, back then that's what it was called, and uh, to get an education. Um, you know, my, my wife, uh, she is a retired soldier about 10 and a half years ago, um, uh, served as a 42 alpha. And so she's, uh, you know, done her time in the army, done very, very well. And as she transitioned out, uh, she pursued a, uh, PhD in human services and, uh, she has licensed certification in family and marital therapy, lots of other certifications to help families, to help soldiers, uh, in the community, uh, within the army and now within this command. So that'd be some of her initiatives is to really reach out into what the CG describes the family soldiers join the army families reenlist. And so that's, that's what we believe. Uh, we have six children together and four grandchildren. And, uh, so they're, they're a bundle of fun. And uh, matter of fact, one of our daughters is coming to visit, uh, tomorrow. Uh, from Savannah uh, with uh, our granddaughter. So it's going to be good to see them as they uh, come in here. And, and I think family is very important too, uh, just as uh, all of you uh, do. I believe fitness is very important. And, you know, everybody, you know, when you say fitness, uh, uh, people talk about you know, physical fitness and that's, that's obviously part of it, but it's all the components of fitness and uh, all the things that uh, we uh, think that make you well balanced as a human being, as a person, and as a soldier. And so uh, 
really looking forward to uh, that balance, that quality of life uh, that you have, um, obviously within the profession of the Army, being recruiters, but also that balance uh, within family, social network, spiritual network, uh, and your emotional uh, uh, network. And so we, we also um, look forward to serving you that way as well. I've been in the Army 31 years, and so that may seem like a long time, but that time has really gone by very fast because, uh, and it's been very fun. The, the things that make it fun is, you know, you have to have a, a good a mission and so uh, to make a difference and have purpose. And when you're around good teammates, uh, that makes it fun and it goes by very fast. A blink of two to three years goes by very, very fast. And as soon as you know it, you're on to your next uh, assignment and your next endeavor. I've been a command sergeant major for 11 of those 31 years and a sergeant major for 12 years. And so served in various billets. And uh, as you know, uh, I am not a seminar Romeo by trade. And I served in recruiting command back in 95 and 98 uh, at Fayetteville, Arkansas, part of OKC Battalion. And so, uh, you know, my so that's my experience in use record. It's great to be back. And um, I'm really glad to be here and I can't be more excited about uh, uh, what we do for our army and our nation to have a ready trained army that's able to fight and win our nation's wars if called upon. Sir, I'll turn it back over to you. So uh, real quick, I do want to kind of frame sort of my thought processes as we uh, start, you know, this command venture together is it, it's, and it's going to be, I'm really excited. I think it's our majors the same way absolutely elated to be, uh, you know, kind of a, a part of this organization uh, as we work as a team, because I do believe in a team team con concept. I think it's critical to, to how you, you really uh, create energy and drive, and everybody's working toward the same goal. Uh, so there's a couple of things that uh, you can call them tenets, principles, philosophy. Um, these are some of the things that uh, I have uh, at least been able to take with me over the last couple of assignments. Uh, and I think these are, are truly, they don't change with the organizations that I am a part of. I think it's, it, it, they're able to uh, withstand the test of time through the organizations that, that I've been uh, um, honored to be a part of. And so first of all, I, you know, for this unique mission here, it's, it, we really have one primary mission when you think about it, and that's to recruit for the all-volunteer force. Uh, the Army became that in, in about 1973. And so um, uh, we are, that's, that's really our fundamental mission. Uh, and, and what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for the best and brightest that, you know, that we could actually fill our ranks with uh, because we want to make sure that our Army uh, has not the, the best quality soldiers we could possibly have. Uh, who is going to do that? Uh, it's going to be our non-commissioned officers. It really, it really will be. Uh, and so um, I am, I am just, I'm such excited about um, the, uh, the ability to be able to, uh, you know, look and see what our Army non-commissioned officers are going to do. Uh, there, there is nobody else that's going to lead us to win, uh, with exception of, uh, of what we do uh, when you look at it uh, in accomplishing our mission, except for really it's going to be on the backs of our non-commissioned officers. So we are a human-based organization. I think the Army is built on people. Uh, and people truly matter. And I would tell you, we have to do everything we can to take care of our people. We need to take care of our people, take care of our soldiers, take care of our civilians, uh, our complete workforce. Uh, because uh, for all of us uh, to be focused on this mission, we all got to sure, ensure that, um, that we are doing everything we can to, to make sure that our organization uh, is uh, focused every single day uh, removed to some of the things that are going on around us. Uh, and if we have those things that impact our soldiers, our families, our DA civilians, uh, then we have to, we have to really have to address it. We have to address it and we have to kind of fix the problems that they are, they're having. So take care of them. Uh, I welcome, uh, new thoughts and ideas. I think we've got to be innovative. We've got to, uh, we've got to listen to every single aspect of, of, of uh, new ideas and, and thoughts that we have across our organization. Uh, I don't care uh, what level of, uh, of employee you are, everybody should be a valuable contributor to this team. Everybody has some great ideas. 
and uh, and we're we're not going to discount uh, the fact that we uh, we have folks who uh, could really have some great great ideas that can lead us to uh, to a pathway to success. And so we 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 offer that. We want. I expect that. I want it. Uh, I want to demonstrate mission command. I I think that's important. Meaning that I am going to push responsibility to the farthest edge possible. Uh, and, and authority to the farthest edge possible so that our commanders and our leaders on the ground can make those decisions uh, and be able to execute uh, based on the environment that they're seeing. Uh, and I say that because uh, there's a lot of things that we can create from this headquarters that may not necessarily be a something that's effective for every single state that we're in. And so the environment is different. And so only commanders and non-commissioned officers know what is ab absolutely happening in their states that they have responsibility for. And so I'm going to I'm going to push, you know, mission command and responsibility and some of the authorities as as far forward as we can. And uh, and it's all built on trust. I mean, that's that's really we're trusting that that our leaders will, will do the right things all the time, even when nobody's looking. Uh, you know, I, I think we are. We got a, a couple things that are going to be the framework of, of how we recruit. You know, and, and we've done this in the past, so we're not changing. Quality is number one. I, I think uh, we are a professional organization, and quality will always be number one uh, for us. You know, and uh, and I talked a little bit about you know the best and brightest. That's part of quality. Uh, diversity. Uh, we we are uh, we are a representation of society of our nation, and uh, and we want to. Uh, recruit from all corners of the United States. That's that's really what what our, what makes our army so strong and so so great is because we have we have all kinds of uh, people serving in this uh, great profession, wearing this uniform. And man, what a great story they all have to tell uh, based on how they got here. That is what resonates with our young generation. They want to see people that look like them, and they want to also see people that are very successful. And their story will have an everlasting uh, impact on those future soldiers that really have a dream. And that's really what we, we're selling, something that you can't feel, you can't touch, you can't sit on. We're, we're, we're actually we're selling an ideal. We're selling a, a, really a dream uh, that some of these future soldiers want, and they've, they've looked for, and they've wanted uh, their entire life. And now they get the opportunity to make this dream come true. And then the last thing, uh, we want good moral character. And, uh, and I would tell you, that's not only the, 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 uh, the young applicants that we are recruiting, but also we want good moral character across our organization because uh, we are professionals. And so we have, to, we have to know why we signed up and why we are serving and why we always want to do the right thing all the time. And that you never know when people are looking at you. Uh, we are we are going through all parts of America. In some cases, you may be the only soldier that somebody will come encounter encounter with. And so um, that first impression is always important because you can't you can't go back and redo it. You can't rerun rewind the tape and say, "Man, I wish I wouldn't have said that," or "Man, I said something wrong," or "Man, I you know I wish I would have had my hair cut uh, when I." was doing a face-to-face -face conversation with this pers perspective soldier. And so, uh, so we want to be good all the time. Uh, and, and, and that's the kind of image we have to have. And then I, the last thing is we're going to treat everybody with dignity and respect. Uh, we have to, uh, because uh, we want to, uh, to display that in every single act that we do. Everybody that we encounter, we want to treat them with dignity and respect. Uh, and, uh, and that is really the cornerstone of how we will operate. And then the last thing is take good care of yourself. Uh, you know, good health, how we eat, you know, how we uh, do PT and physical exercise and fitness. That, that's all a part of, of, uh, of staying uh, fit so that we can endure uh, this great journey that we're all going to be on. All right. Uh, I'm going to turn it over, I think, to the moderator. Uh, and uh, we'll start. Questions. Okay, sir, CSM, uh, welcome to the USREC team and your first virtual town hall. So we will get started with the questions. First question uh, for you, sir. 
Social media managers at the battalion level are very important for not only the digital marketing skills they possess for localized marketing, but also for continuity in the virtual recruiting stations. These positions are still term positions. Are there any plans to make these positions permanent? That's a great question. Uh, and so uh, I, I do want to say that uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the impact of social media and, and, uh, and what we do, what we're, we've been able to do uh, in very short order. If you think about where we came from and, uh, you know, six years ago, I, I probably would venture to say we, we probably didn't even have this idea that we will be uh, in this social you know, media space like we are today. So I, I, I I understand the value and I really appreciate the value of social media. And I think uh, we are we're looking at how we can actually uh, have our positions become permanent. And so uh, there's about four, I think there's about 44, um, you know, as social media managers, uh, media managers that we that we have that we're trying to fill. And, and so we know that we have seen the utility of this great capability pushed to the farthest edge. Uh, that we can push it because really, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's you know it's it's the local um, you know the the local social media advertising marketing um, you know programs that really uh, help us produce a lot of, of energy and drive when it comes to generating leads and uh, and and being able to to reach that specific demographic of uh, of uh, you know future soldier that we're trying to reach. And so I understand and value the importance of. It. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna work very hard to to uh, to get to where we have permanent structure uh, at the battalion level and and try to know uh, to fill those 44 positions uh, with permanent authorizations uh, because we do see the value in it. Okay, thank you, sir. The the next question. Uh, it is in the personnel field, so this will go out to G1. What is the plan for civilians at headquarters and in the brigades with regard to working parents whose children are going to have to attend virtual school due to the virus? Are we going to be allowed to work from home during this time? Kelly, that's a great question. Uh, I'm Charles Price. I'm the deputy G1. Uh, because this virus affects different regions at different times, the decision to return to normal operations is at the local level. Local leaders will make those decisions based on guidance from their local health officials. You know, supervisors need to discuss this with their individual employees for every individual situation. You know, they need to look at the full spectrum of workplace flexibility when they're offering options to their employees, including telework and alternate work schedules, uh, Full-time telework is not the only option. If leaders need them to come in on, you know, for to meet a requirement, they can do that. Uh, a hybrid schedule might be another recommendation for leaders on the ground to accommodate employees who worked in the day who may have challenges with childcare or other things that you know emerging issues presented by COVID. Uh, and you know that's the guidance from the G1. Hey, sir, if I can chime in just uh, one one caveat or one additional point, you know, I, I talked about this is about leadership. And so when you talk about uh, what we what we uh, charge our commanders and our leaders with is, you know, identifying and assessing risk and mitigating it. And so we will always empower that the subordinate leaders to do that at their local levels and not try to come up with a you know, one size fits all because it's not one size fits all. There's, there's many locations and there's many factors going on. And when you see what's happening on the ground, leaders should should be making those decisions. It's keeping their uh, workforce and their uh, recruiters and the civilians informed on that. Over. Absolutely, CSO. Okay, thank you for that, Sir Major. Uh, while, while you're up, I think we have another question that will be uh, in your lane, Sergeant Major, based on your previous experiences. I'm hearing concerns for and from new soldiers about their health, quarters, treatment, and rations at multiple basic training receptions. Is USREC currently speaking with TRADOC about the well-being of our new soldiers, and what are the plans to correct the situations? Okay, thank you for that, and that's a very good question, and uh, just as all of um, all of you are concerned, and I thank you for your concern for 
and to care for the people that you um, have recruited and put in the Army and their well-being. And so our, our network or our relationship with the uh, Center for Initial Military Training that's in charge of all initial entry training for the entire Army, so basic training, AIT, and, and a lot of our warrant, uh, warrant officer and um, uh, officer courses. Uh, our relationship with them and, uh, and the Army Training Centers at the four primary stations, which is Sill, Lunarwood, Benning, and uh, Jackson. My former, my former uh, job as the post-CSM and the fire center back at Fort Sill, I have the opportunity to oversee and basic training for those two years, uh, specifically in all the operations. So as you know, we paused uh, shipping um, at the start of COVID. Uh, to reassess and to kind of get systems in place and processes in place in order to protect our cadre and our, uh, our civilian workforce as well as our trainees that were coming into uh, basic combat training. And so these, these concerns, I had the same concerns that over our Fort Sill town halls and, um, you know, on the rations and the treatment. And I will tell you that um, once they get there, they are – they, are, they go into this two plus eight uh, model of basic training, meaning they do an initial nine operations of reception and processing that last about two hours. And then from straight from that moment on, they go into a controlled monitoring uh, inside their barracks at 50% capacity where they are tested in uh, for a COVID testing. And then those that are not uh, uh, that have tested uh, positive for that, then they get isolated into different quarters. But in that in that yellow phase of two weeks, they do all the the you know the classroom training and everything that you would do in a red phase of basic training. I won't get on to specifics of that, but the point is those trainees get screened, um, they get checked up on uh, regularly and frequently, as well as the drill stars and cadre too, because they're in this uh, thing we call the bubble. Uh, the rations or the meals are actually brought to them. And so they eat well. We actually went down there to see because it was there, there was some concern about it. So I went down there personally to go see uh, what was going on and how they're being fed and how they're being taken care of. And they also get them outside to do PT as well in a safe environment, socially distanced, um, and they're away from other people, obviously. And so uh, thank you for that concern. But I'll I, I, and I'm, I'm talking from a Fort Sill perspective, but I think across the enterprise uh, throughout TRADOC, we're kind of uh, uh, exercising those same practices to ensure that uh, that our soldiers and our, are remaining healthy. They get a proper quarters. They get the proper treatment if needed, and they're getting fed properly. Okay, thank you for that, Sir Major. Along those same lines, um, regarding communication efforts uh, about some of these reports. Um, is the command working on dispelling reports about the lack of care for trainees during the pandemic? For example, reports are coming out, but they're being packed in holdover rooms and aren't being paid because they haven't entered reception. No, very good question. That kind of leads into this uh, same kind of uh, question or the same kind of response. And so when a soldier tests uh, so number one, they go into two plus eight, and they're, they're going to just controlled monitoring, 50% barracks capacity, so they get the space between each other. Um, and then if somebody tests positive, we put them in a different facility, and they're really, there's, I mean, there's not that many that, that test positive. There's a, there's a pocket full, and it's less than a percent or two of the total uh, fill for basic training. And so during the night operations, they go into night operations. That's when all the trainees hit the, the reception battalions. And, I, and as I said previously, it's two. It's about two hours of paperwork, and they're really enrolling them into the army and turning on their pay. That's what they're doing. And then they got to get that stuff squared away because you want a trainee to be paid. Um, they want them to be enrolled in the system so they can track them. And then after that, they'll pick up their night bag, uh, which is full of PT gear and some boots and the bare necessities. And it's already been, uh, you know, they already been sized for it, running shoes, toiletries, et cetera. And they'll take them straight to the barracks. Um, and then they won't even get haircuts. They won't get anything until they uh, 
uh, test out of the two weeks and they go they go to reception to complete the rest of the in process before they start their eight weeks of basic training. So hopefully that answers your question. And um, you know, I, you know, we always want to be concerned with our soldiers and our trainees, but I really believe that they are based on my experience in my last assignment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, CSM. Next question, uh, I believe we'll go to the G1. Um, and CSM, I believe you have some input on this one as well. How do we as an organization ensure talent is managed as efficiently as possible when G1 has now been given the task of assigning USREC personnel with very little influence from the battalion and the brigade? Battalions and brigades know their soldiers better than anything G1 can read in records. Kelly, that's a great question. Uh, as we look at this, you know, we need those unit leaders to know their soldiers on the ground because those unit leaders will use that knowledge to, you know, to mentor and train their soldiers to perform in different roles, to grow them, uh, ensuring evaluations are accurately documented in performance, uh, and also positioning them and, and training them to fill other positions in our great organization. The assignment process at USREC G1 is executing with you know guidance from the leadership is is mirrored and kind of dovetailing into the Army's talent management process. If you look at that, that's being applied to the enlisted forces we're going forward. It's already out there for the officer force. And if you look at the way that our command sergeant majors and our sergeant majors are being managed, they're already being managed using the Army's talent management process. You know, where how units can help us with you know in, improving this process and ensuring that they identify the knowledge, skills, and behaviors that a soldier needs to have in order to successfully perform in an individual recruiting role, whether that's a station commander, whether that's a recruiter, an operations, medical recruiter, any of the number of recruiting positions across our great command. Uh, we have to look at the entire breadth of the Santa Romeo force and manage assignments across not just an individual battalion, not an individual, individual brigade, but across the Army. And so as we do this, units play an important role as they accurately train and document how their soldiers are performing. And I'll turn this over to Sergeant Major. Thank you, Mr. Price. And, uh, you know, the talent management, talent alignment is, is has a major shift in the recent uh, last couple of years. And, and especially on the enlisted side, because we're not used to the, the new manning cycles that's been established. We have five manning cycles for the enlisted force as a, compared to two for our officers. Um, but I will tell you, so we have to learn, we have to educate ourselves on that process. I think that's the very first thing. The second thing is we have to change our culture and really uh, be able to share our best people with the rest of the Army. Um, and and the rest of the command. And so that's hard to do. Uh, it's hard to give up somebody that's really, really good. Uh, but if it hurts, it's probably the right person to give up. Uh, and then the last point I'll make is with the, the new way we're trying to manage and uh, align talent is, um, yes, we'll have to implement a new process for talent alignment and talent management across the force, and especially across this command. But we still have to have a balance on, on leaders um, on the ground to give us, uh, you know, that flexibility because that we can't allow a critical billet to go unfilled if the man cycle hasn't hasn't uh, covered on it or that person didn't show up. And there's many factors on why somebody doesn't report. So if that person doesn't get there, we have a critical billet we have to fill. And we can't let it go unfilled like a station commander or a first sergeant billet. Um, and, and that's one of our must win kind of markets, then we should be allowing our battalion uh, commanders and CSMs to put the right person in there. Um, so there has to be a little bit of give and take on this. We have to educate ourselves and we got to let the process kind of run, but also remain flexibility with, the, uh, with our leaders out there. Thanks. Great question though. Okay, thanks Charles and sorry Major. Charles, I believe we have another question in your lane. Is there any guidance on the qualifications and criteria for AIP? If it's based on net contracts from FY19, what is the minimum to qualify for the AIP? 
will there be messages out to explain the qualifications and criteria in order to be transparent across the command? Kelly, that's a great question. As we went into this, um, the IP program changed when it was initially put out to where it came out. And so it's a bit, a bit of nuance on that. As we looked on this, you know, DA select recruiters are eligible to extend for six to 12 months. But some of the things that, you know, constraints that the department put into the memo was they have to be permanently assigned to use rec and must complete their initial 36 month recruiting tour. So that's the first thing. They have to be, uh, they have to be scheduled to leave the command by 30 September this year and be fully eligible to PCS. They have to be good standing while they're being recommended for AIP. In order to continue to draw AIP, they still have to be in good standing. Um, they have to be assigned to a company whose enlisted recruiter strength is projected to be 104% or lower through the AIP period. And so that's a constraint we didn't have before. So the, the information we received from leadership on shaping this was, you know, setting the threshold that he had to accomplish 10 or more recruiting contracts during FY19. And then the, in order to make sure that we're returning soldiers to the force, we set a, a criteria of no more than 40 months in use or at assignment to make sure that only those soldiers who hadn't taken AIP or hadn't been extended would be eligible for this AIP as we go forward, because we know those soldiers, those dassers that are returning to the force, you know, there's career goals that they have to meet too. And this was some of the guidance that we received as leadership when we're shaping the eligibility criteria for the AIP. Okay, thank you, Charles. Next question, uh, I believe Sir and CSM will, will be in your lane for the future of our command. With recruiters being the face of the Army and their communities, how is the command planning on showing the Army cares about issues such as systemic racism against black and brown communities and the questions we're receiving about safety and sexual assault and harassment based on the specialist skiing case? Okay, uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I kind of figured this would uh, actually uh, come up with it, you know, and, uh, you know, first of all, I think, uh, I think we, have to, we have to accept the fact that um, you know, do we have um, unconscious bias, racism in, in, in our army? And, uh, and, and we just have to be real about, you know, answering that question. Yes, we do. Um, you, you know, is that against the army's values? Of course it is. Uh, and so, so we know what our, you know, we know what reality is. We know, understand what our values are. Uh, and, and we just got to really focus on, on the essence of ensuring that our soldiers um, know that we're in a value-based organization. And so we all have to assess ourselves. We, uh, this is individuals assessing themselves and to include our recruiters to ensure that we are doing everything we can to, um, as we engage with, uh, with uh, the prospective soldiers, to ensure that our story, I mean, because that's that's really what resonates is, and that's, that's the real part of, of being able to, um, to uh, attract this generation of, uh, of soldiers. The our story, you know, highlights and shows the goodness of our army. And, uh, but understanding that we, we are not perfect. We are, we are not perfect. Are we striving to be perfect? Yes, we are. Um, I, I will also say that uh, when you look at all the organizations in, um, you know, in, in America, uh, the Army is probably the most diverse organization that we have. And that alone, and because our mission is so valuable and so critical to, um, to our nation, uh, we, we have to have everybody working together. You know, we cannot have, a, a, you know, one missing link in our chain. Because when we do that, it, 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 it impacts the readiness of our formations. And so, so when you have, you know, racism, uh, and when you have things that go against the readiness of our formation, that can easily cause one of our links to be missing, uh, not necessarily physically, but maybe mentally, psychologically, uh, all those things that come with, you know, a, a person now saying, "Hey, look, I don't like the person next to me." And by the way, we've got a, you know, we've got a uh, a, a go to war mission because the army's built to fight and win. And so we have to ensure that our army 
remains strong. And, and so it's going to take all of us to be able to do that. Uh, and the stories that you, the positive stories that our recruiters are able to tell about their experiences in the Army uh, is really, that's, that's what's going to resonate with, uh, with our young generation. Uh, you think about it. I'm just going to throw some facts, just two critical facts. We are the second largest, um, you know, hiring organization, you know, or, or man organization in the United States. I'll tell you the first one is Walmart. Uh, that is the that is the number one uh, largest hiring organization uh, in, in the United States. Uh, but we're the second largest. And so and, and you think about our mission. I mean, what a mission we have. There's nobody else that has this mission that we have uh, when you think about global reach and all the things that our army is asking us to do. And so we have to be an army that's strong and we have to do everything we can to, uh, you know, to, uh, to prevent unconscious bias and racism inside of our formation because it impacts our readiness of our formation. The second fact I want to tell you is, you know, if you, if you made the U S army, a, a, a city in the United States, it will be the 10th largest city in the United States, man, that's, that's a lot of people that that's a lot of people. And, and so, um, so are we perfect? No, uh, we're not. Okay. And so, uh, but I'll tell you some things that you, that we need to do and that we should be doing. First of all, it, it kind of starts with me. It starts with me and the Sergeant Major. Uh, and, uh, and we, we posted a, this is my squad video like two days ago. Uh, the reason why we did that was for several reasons. One, it shows a diversity of, of my, you know, my command group. Uh, and and it, I mean, it shows the diversity and it shows all of us trying to work together for for a good end and a good outcome. You know, and the second thing it talks about is uh, is knowing every single member of our team. And, and the only way that we're going to we're going to get after, you know, uh, you know, these biases and the things that we have maybe grown up uh, around is that we've got to understand what other people, uh, how they feel, uh, what's going on with them. And that's the this is my squad sort of concept, because we have to know uh, our people. We have to know what what their highs and lows. And the only way we're going to do that is we've got to know them as a person. And so and then we've got to be able to have open dialogue. We got to be able to talk to one another, you know, and our recruiters need to be able to talk to their, the folks that are, you know, the recruiters that are in their recruiting offices, their, their recruiting stations, because we're on the same team and we're not going to we're not we're all are not going to agree on every single topic we're not but we got to listen and have you know and be receptive that we have different thoughts we have different ideas uh but man i'll tell you what when it's time to go and fight our nation's wars hey i'm taking foley with me i'm taking schmidt with me i'm taking chris with me i'm taking uh you know uh, our chiefs of staff i'm taking them with me because they are my team and i know that they have my back and that's the kind of energy we got to build in us inside of our formation and so we are, we are not good. We're not perfect, uh, but we're, we're, we're really good at doing what the Army has caused us to do. And the reason why is because we are able to meld all different ethnic groups together for one common goal. And, and that's what makes us good. Sorry, Major. Hey, sir, I appreciate you, uh, you know, highlighting this is my squad and the importance of that. Uh, and so I, I would just leave it with this, you know, treating everybody in your squad right and respecting them is huge. So everybody within your, and so what do you control? Look at what you control and what you have uh, oversight of. And so the people that work directly around you. And then really, I mean, where it really starts is if you think about what you do every day is those future soldiers that you have in your, in your formations, they are your squad. They, they really are. And so you have to really, uh, educate them on our values, on our Army values, and what it means to be part of a team, uh, what it means to respect one another, and all those things before you even get the basic training. That's our responsibility to do that. So if we want to grow them early, the first contact is with recruiters. It is not at basic combat training. And so, you know, we always like to leverage and say it's, you know, it's drill sergeant's fault and why a soldier came out this way. Well, we all have a responsibility in that. And so uh, I'll just leave with that. Our future soldiers are in our squad and we have to own them and we have to take responsibility for them. Thank you. 
I do want to come back to the uh, special studio case because, uh, you know, for for reasons now, I think a lot of you all know, this is a case that's still being investigated. So I can't talk much about that case. But what I will tell you, and I and I think we all know, is that uh, you you want to tear at the fabric of of, of our our army. Uh, you know, one way is through sexual assaults and sexual harassment. I mean, there there should be no place. There is no place for that in our formation. And so we we all have a responsibility to to play in this. Uh, if we're gonna you know have an army that's professional, an army that enforces standards and discipline. Hey, we, we all have an obligation to do that. And, uh, and and that's what I'm expecting our non-commissioned officers, our officers, our warrant officers, even our civilians. Uh, we all are going to be uh, safety officers. I mean, and, and if you've been in the Army long enough, you understand that uh, when you see something that's not right uh, on a range, guess what? You become the person that stops the range from continuing because we've got to deal with the problem and we've got to set the conditions so that everybody can be safe. That's the same thing with sexual assault, with sexual harassment, and uh, and so I want everybody to to be a part of this uh, this process. It shouldn't take General Marine, shouldn't take Sergeant Major Foley, shouldn't take our commanders. I am empowering. That's one talking about Michigan Command. I am commanding all of single every single one of you all have the authority and the responsibility to stamp out sexual assaults and sexual harassment in our formation. So you want responsibility? There's one. And I'm giving it to every single one of you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Next question, um, I believe, kind of kind of falls between uh, the command surgeon uh, as well as G3. So we'll start with the command surgeon. What is the current policy regarding the utilization of stations? Do individual battalions have their own policy, or do we go by USAREC policy and guidelines? What about maps? How are we mitigating the risk if we are literally back to normal? Good afternoon, USAREC. Uh, this is Colonel Katrina Walters, your command surgeon. Um, just a couple of things. So the COVID threat is going to continue, and we have to find a way to operate in the COVID environment while reducing risk. Commanders and really soldiers and civilians at all levels have a wide toolkit available to them to reduce risk. The most effective risk mitigation tools are staying home when you're sick, keeping uh, sick folks at home and then following appropriate quarantine guidelines if you come in close contact with someone who's sick. If you have a medical condition that places you at increased risk for severe illness, then talk to your chain of command because continued telework may be appropriate. Distance, time of exposure, and concentration are keys to this virus. So you wanna maximize your distance from other people. You wanna minimize time of exposure to large gatherings and you wanna decrease your concentration of exposure by again, avoiding those large gatherings and wearing a mask when you can't. Um, lastly, you wanna be sure to wash your hands and clean surfaces regularly. The good news is, is that these risk reduction efforts are working. So USAREC as a whole has had a very low infection rate and we can continue to keep it low with everyone's diligence. With that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Sherman to talk about the operational piece. Real quick. Hey, thanks, Doc. Sorry. Todd Sherman here, you know, Deputy G3. And you know what the doc talks about is important. And I'd share with you that are we in a new and are we in a new normal operations? You know, I know that next week this headquarters is going to relook what guidance is out there uh, under the command group. But you know, this headquarters fought hard to get new policy changes for us to it that allows you all to conduct operations virtually. So, you know, we can do everything, as you know, virtually sharing documents, source documents to build packets. And then, you know, we have to do a hot seat or a live scan, but believe those are capable to be done, social distancing, proper PPE. We've always had the ability to allow parents or influencers to transport your applicants to the hotel lodging and or the maps, however that works in your area. So again, I think this is really looking at a new norm for a process and we'll continue to grow that. Thanks. I wanna talk just real quick about uh, the COVID environment. And so, and I really wanna put it on uh, our recruiters. Uh, we talk about, we are the, you know, we are the first sort of, uh, you know, entry, the doorway to the army. And so, you know, our recruiting stations, yeah, we have to make sure that one, that we are doing everything we can to work within the uh, the medical 
and the safety precautions. You know, so uh, I, you know, even uh, when you look at some of the survey data, and I've been able to kind of look at it over the last couple of days, you know, there's a lot of people that are concerned about, you know, their their sons and daughters joining the army because uh, because of COVID. You know, what a tremendous um, sort of display of adhering to the the health protection guidelines when they walk into a recruiting station, and and because we have there's some things that we have to do inside of our station. Uh, but they walk in there and they see that our non-commissioned officers are serious about the health protection conditions. And they're serious about ensuring that everybody's in PPE, we're maximizing social distancing, we're wearing masks. Uh, that will lend a level of comfort to those parents who have a huge concern about their sons and daughters joining the Army. And, and I'll tell you, it will cause uh, a, a true release of anxiety uh, and hesitation. And you will be amazed at just that little impact of what it will make uh, with uh, with regards to now folks feeling comfortable about, man, you know, the Army's got it right. Wow, I know that my son and daughter is going to be safe. You just look at what they're doing now. I mean, so that is the impact. But it starts with our non-commissioned officers. It starts with our, our recruiters ensuring that their workspaces, their offices, their facilities are are, uh, are in accordance with uh, the, uh, the health uh, uh, protection uh, and prevention uh, uh, models that uh, that we expect them to be. And you all have all the guidelines. So I'm, I'm asking you to, to make sure that we enforce that. Thank you, sir. Okay, next question goes to Mr. Chairman in G3. Is there any way to talk to MEPCOM about the 20 point increase on the ASVAB that requires a confirmation test? If the test is taken at the MEPS itself, why would they require a confirmation test? And are they going to look at removing that if the test is taken at the MAPS? Hey, thanks, Kelly. Uh, so, team, we've addressed this on a couple different occasions with OSD and all the higher headquarters. Here's the reality of the confirmation test. The confirmation test is not used to validate the person is actually the one taking the test. It's to validate the person's true test taking ability. That's the purpose of the confirmation test. Now, I do believe that OSD is currently relooking everything about the ASVAB and is it dated? You know, there's something to say about that because as you try and look at a new ASVAB like test, it would take a whole renorming and uh, that takes years and money. So, but I do believe they're doing it. But again, the, the myth about the confirmation test validating it's the actual person taking the test is not the reason they take it. It's to identify their true test taking ability. That's what the purpose of it is for. Kelly, back to you. Thank you for that, Todd. Next question, I believe will go to Colonel Doherty and G79. I believe masks with the Army logo on them would be a great tool to gain popularity or maintain relationships with schools. Is it possible to add this item on ADC? If so, how long will it take to get it on the shelf? If ADC isn't possible or takes too long, can we have them made locally, but allow recruiters to claim RER to recoup the cost? Yeah, thanks, Kelly. I appreciate that. And, and I'm going to answer this purely from a marketing perspective, kind of in the reverse order that it was asked, because that's really the only way that I can address this. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going under the lens that what you are asking about is personal presentation items, uh, i.e. a tool that you're going to use to generate leads from a prospect and not personal protection equipment. Uh, something that you intend to uh, issue to soldiers in uniform because that's that's a whole different uh, whole different line of questioning uh, what, what i would tell you is that you can use direct advertising funds to purchase uh, these branded masks locally your battalions have that uh, authorization uh, your battalion staff can help you with that uh, they, they can assist you through that process uh, the rer exception uh, is is limited uh, through the end of September for boosting of social media. So that that that's not the appropriate uh, uh, methodology to to purchase these locally. But direct advertising funds would be, and again, your your battalions can help you with that. Uh, do know that our team is working with uh, Tradoc on adding Army branded masks uh, into the ADC inventory as a PPI. Uh, that's going to be a Tradoc decision. It works through a contract uh, procurement process. So my suggestion would be to, to uh, work through your battalion staff and purchase that stuff locally if you feel that it's going to be an effective tool uh, in your areas. Over.
Thank you, Colonel Doherty. Uh, so a question I have coming in for the CG and SAR major. How will the command team continue to be innovative in reaching our youth of today to consider Army opportunities? So uh, let me start. Uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit to this answer. First, we, we got to continue to uh, uh, to understand how our youth are receiving information and, and what what uh, what actually um, drives them to uh, to our army and, and to making decisions to want to join our military. So so we have to be able to continue to kind of do that. Now we do have. I mean, we've got you know I've, we've got analysts. We've got all kinds of folks who study this uh, and, and they do it and that's their profession. So we have we have the capability in our headquarters uh, that helps us do that. Uh, we also have to continue to innovate. Uh, we also have to, you know, when I say innovate, I mean uh, through technology uh, and through understanding, uh, you know, what what applications are are, are the ones that they're they're latching on to. Uh, you know, I, I, I said this previously in one interview, I was like, you know, hey, look, these 17 and 30 through 34 year olds are not on Facebook. Uh, they're not they're not on Facebook anymore. And so if we're like using Facebook to do that, then uh, then we'd be shooting behind the behind the duck. And we and so that's that's, you know, trying to keep up with with the nuances of technology. We are we I tell you, we are making uh, huge strides in, in that arena. And I am just you know, I, I talk about being removed from USREC for one year. But to look at where uh, this organization has gone uh, in, in just a one year time frame that I was doing another job. I mean, I am just astounded by uh, by the amount of capability. So we have to do that. We have to continue to uh, to uh, evolve. You know, I'll, I'll just just one quick example. I'll turn over to the Sergeant Major. Uh, you know, about a year ago, I think I was still I was at USREC, and I have my nephew. My nephew came up to visit. Uh, I, I got we got all the house ready for him. I, you know, and I told my wife, I said we got to have a TV in the in the room with, for him. You know, because he's he was about at the time he was probably about 14, 15 years old or so. And uh, and so he was there. I got the TV ready, and you know, and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm sitting out front watching TV. I go in and uh, open the door. I said, hey, look, that TV works. And uh, you know, he's got his phone. He's like, hey, I don't, I don't watch TV. I really don't watch TV. <laughs> he's like, he said, I get all my stuff on the phone. And uh, and so he was streaming, in, you know, uh, movies and you know, and TV shows. And he was also, you know, surfing, uh, you know, social media and things of that nature. But but he wasn't even looking at the TV. And, and that was that was an eye opening experience for me. And it was like, wow, I was like, well, I, you just told me how we need to be recruiting. We were already doing it. But to me, that was validation that uh, that these kids are, are moving uh, at, at uh, warp speed from platform to platform. And, and the television is no probably no longer the, the number one thing that they're actually looking at. And that's all I have. It's our major. Hey, thank you, sir. Um, this is an interesting topic because there's so many ways we can reach our youth and, um, you know, technology at, at, at the tip of our fingers is one of them. And I think we all have to be able to learn that. We have to be willing to learn and educate ourselves and get people to educate us on the different virtual platforms. And I'll tell you what, since taking this job, uh, you know, eight days ago, I, there's platforms I've never heard of. And so I have to be able to be open to that. Uh, and, and utilize that. But the human interaction um, will never go away. We have to be able to communicate with people. And obviously we have this targeted 17 and 34 year old qualified applicant we want to put in the Army, but we can't miss the opportunity to talk to anybody because um, they're influencers, whether they're qualified or not. And, and so if we have, you know, up there's a 71, 72 percent of military uh, age um, uh, Americans that are unqualified um, and they come in, you know, hey, maybe they know somebody that that the Army could be good for. And so, you know, our influences are key. Um, they're able to spread our message, but obviously we have to dominate uh, all of our environments um, and be willing to do that to be able to communicate with youth. And that's, it's easier said than done, but just talk to people, talk to people, talk to people. Thanks. Okay, sir, we have time for one more question and then we'll wrap it up. I think this question will be best with uh, with the DCG, General Michaelis. Um, what, have, what were the results from the Army National Hiring Day? 
Hey, consider it that's almost been a month since we uh, executed Army National Hiring Days. It's some great effort on behalf of the entire command in, in being able to drive activity to the top of all of our funnels. So as of today, uh, we've got about 461 contracts out of it with a projection to go to almost 6,000 contracts because of the hard work that you all did and being able to drive activity to goarmy.com. Uh, the rest of the Army's involvement uh, on the social media platforms uh, from Forcecom to AMC to Futures Command. Um, it was it was interesting because we almost had we had we had about uh, I think it was 79,000 existing leads of which 21,000 were linked directly to the MAC code, the AMMZ MAC code. So so all around we see this as a success. The, to make it to solidify that success, though, it is critical that that you all continue to cultivate those leads in the system and drive them all the way down to the to the contract line. We will be doing something like this again. We're doing the AAR, but thank you all for your incredible energy against this um, in 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 helping us kickstart the system. Thank you. Okay, sir, that's all the time we have if you want to uh, do closing comments. All right, I think, did we get back on? All right, hey, sorry, Major, you want to? You have closing remarks if you're on. Sorry, Major. I'm on, sir. Okay, you have closing remarks real quick. Okay, hey, so um, I just wanted to kind of close with a couple things and that I think is important and, and what you got to know that that I feel is important to me that you will probably hear a lot of. And uh, it's these three key things that I equate to um, my principles of excellence. and. Um, they're not all inclusive, but I think if you get these 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 three things right uh, on a daily basis or try to, you will be highly, highly successful and achieve excellence in life and in the Army. And so, number one, and, and our recruiters out there, I hope you're writing this down because, uh, uh, or you can come back and, and uh, view the video. So, number one, and I think this is uh, really critical to be fit, well-trained, disciplined, and resilient. Um, and, and we are charged to do that. That's what we need to be every day. Uh, number two uh, principle of excellence is, you know, it's, it's kind of hinged under this is my squad. And that's setting your goals, improving every day, and making everybody around you better. Uh, because you don't get to pick your team. And so who you have is who you have. You have to improve your team and improve yourself every day. And then number three, guiding principle for excellence every day is to live our values. Uh, treat people right and respect everyone. And if we can do that, if we can live our army values, we'll be highly successful. And, and so to cap it off, uh, you know, quality of life is, is huge. And the way and what you are talking about at the dinner table at night uh, with your family is important. And, and I say that's because you can have the positive conversation say, I have a great team, I have a great station, I have a great command, I have leaders that care about me, or it can be the reverse. And obviously, uh, we want to have those positive uh, uh, conversations with our family. We want to empower and encourage our, uh, our leaders out there. We want to encourage them to give us feedback, to give us uh, all those ideas in order to improve our organization and our command, because uh, you know this is our squad, this is your team, and um, and you can make a difference in it. And then we'll, and then we want to award those people uh, and recognize them appropriately. We want to give out lots of awards and lots of recognition. They don't cost anything, and so we are looking for people to uh, at doing the right thing, and. Um, and speaking of awards and, and recognition, we're going to be recognizing here in the next week and a half our top 13 station commanders um, uh, that 
was put on hold for a little while due to COVID. And we're gonna do that and the chief staff of the Army is gonna be able to recognize those and award them appropriately uh, with uh, meritorious service medals. And that's huge. And you'll be able to watch that on Facebook Live as your peers or your friends out there get recognized. And the last thing I'll leave with you is what you have to know about me. Um, I'm a Gators fan. And so uh, we can talk about that throughout my travels. I'm a long time Gators fan uh, back in the uh, early mid eighties when I was growing up. And, um, and and that's what I love. And, and I'm also a Tampa Bay Buccaneers fan, not because of, uh, you know, the greatest of all time that came from New England uh, to join the Bucks, but I've been a Bucks fan for a long time and been waiting a long time since 02 for them to win the Super Bowl. So hopefully they can get that done. Last thing is what you can expect from me. You can expect energy from me. You can expect me to have some presence. You can expect inspiration from me. And you can expect me to lead by example. Um, and you can expect me to stay connected with you on social media. Um, I'm, I'm always willing to talk. Uh, and if you have anything for me, please, uh, you know, obviously go through your leadership. There is a there is a pecking order in leadership. We want them to be informed. But if I can help you in any way to be successful and to achieve excellence, I will be able to do that. I want to learn from you. So when I come out, teach me something. Show me something I don't know because I don't know a lot um, about uh, what you do every day because you're the experts and you're the masters in the field. I want to be able to get better and I want your feedback as I come out. Thank you for being, uh, you know, for listening to this forum. I'm very, very happy to join your team and um, I'm here to serve you. Sir, over to you. Final comments of just a few. One, uh, we, our future soldiers want to be a part of something that's good uh, at the end of the day. And so uh, it, we are literally the entryway to the Army. And so make our organization be one of, of good, one of professionalism, and one of, and one of greatness. The second thing is, I, I told you about the responsibilities that I implore on our non-commissioned officers. I would ask every single non-commissioned officer to go back and look at your non-commissioned officer creed. In that creed, it, it talks about your responsibilities as a non-commissioned officer, and really your responsibilities uh, to our Army and to the officer corps. And, uh, and, and so I, I will give you maximum authority and responsibility inside the NCO Creed um, so you, you can operate effectively and you can help us win. The only way, the only way we are going to be successful and win is it's going to be on the shoulders, the backs uh, of our non-commissioned officer corps. Uh, there is probably no other organization in the Army that has uh, that sort of uh, sort of interaction and sort of leverage of, 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 of responsibility and authority other than, than what we do here at USA Ray. So, so I'm empowering our non-commissioned officers to help us lead the way to, to be a winner. And then the last thing I, I want to tell you is I, what I, you can expect from me, I'm going to help you in any way. That's, that's, I, re, I really truly mean that. I am here to help you be successful, every single one of you uh, be successful. I will give you 100% effort, uh, commitment, passion, um, in in uh, in all that I can do uh, to help us uh, be what we are for the Army, and uh, and we have to know what we are for the Army. And I told you about that mission. It's only one mission. It's the primary mission that we have. So I will help you in every way. I will give you all I can uh, so that we can be we can absolutely win. We are a winning team. And I'm just proud to be on this winning team. That's all I have. Y'all have a great weekend. Be safe and stay safe.